Gemar Chatima Tova, everybody. Shana Tova. So unlike my wife, who's very practical, I find it very difficult to throw stuff away. <clears throat> and when we packed up our first house, our first house in Las Vegas, and we schlepped across the country to Florida, I clung to everything. I snuck into boxes more tattered t-shirts, a knee brace from an ACL surgery years before. I never wore the knee brace, but God forbid I might need it again. I threw it in. A broken wine stopper. Broken, couldn't use it. But it was the first gift that Angie gave me, so I, I put it in. Tchotchkes fit for a garage sale, but tchotchkes that for whatever reason had sentimental value to me. The boxes arrived in Weston. They were opened by my far more practical wife and my clandestine attempt of transferring stuff that sat in boxes in Vegas to stuff that would sit in boxes in Weston, it was exposed. And it did not go well. There's a book, it's called Compulsive Hoarding and the Meaning of Stuff. It's written by psychologists Randy Frost and Gail Stachetti. And they delve into the intricate web of human psychology that underlies our relationship with our possessions. And they emphasize the nuanced line between saving stuff and saving too much stuff. I'm not talking about things with utility things with actual value. I'm talking about the stuff we project subjective meaning onto, which is only valuable to us. Why do I save a ripped t-shirt from 1993? More than one of them. <laughs> now the authors, they suggest that saving items, particularly those enriched with subjective value, it's driven by a fundamental human desire to capture and preserve moments emotions, identities, the stuff we keep in the back of a closet or in the box in the attic, it might be a tangible conduit to our past. It encapsulates cherished memories, significant milestones, deeply ingrained experiences, and the habit is rooted in a tapestry of positive emotions, nostalgia, love, comfort. What's the line? Saving stuff is essential. It's essential for maintaining connections to our past, maintaining a connection to our sense of self, but there comes a point when it's necessary to consider an overhaul. Frost and Stachetti, they give us the key considerations for determining when to part with your stuff. Decluttering for mental health. Lack of physical space. Changing needs. And finally, Quantity over quality. I add a fifth. When your spouse says so. <laughs> now we've all got a version. Every single person in this room has a version of the tattered t-shirt, the broken wine stopper, the tchotchkes we cling to but that others would relegate to the garage, the garage sale, or the garbage. So I wonder, I wonder if there is something, some form of stuff that has no inherent, no objective value at all, no utility, but that none of us in here would be comfortable throwing away. Something we would lug around with us in boxes, regardless of how many times we moved. So by show of hands, how many of you have a Yortzite plaque currently lit up on the wall? If you don't, you will. Because it's an unfortunate group we're all going to belong to. 
I have your type plaques on the wall. They're right over there. My grandparents, Angie's grandparents, Angie's mother, right over there. Your type plaques are peculiar. They maintain zero halachic or even ritual significance. If I were to drop a Yortzite plaque on the floor, I'd simply pick it up. No kiss. They're not put in a gazina, in a geniza. They're not buried like a sidur or a Torah. How do you discard a Yortzite plaque? You throw it away in the same way you would a soda can. There's no traditional inherent meaning, no monetary value to the pieces of metal that adorn the walls of the sanctuary. But those Yortzite plaques are strangely sacred to each of us, aren't they? Now one of the privileges, privileges of experiencing services from the Bema as opposed to in the congregation is that I see everything. I see everything. And I'm emotionally taken aback every single service. Everyone. Because I watch as many of you begin your davening with the same ritual. You enter the sanctuary from over there. You make your way to a particular place along one of these walls. You kiss your hand. You reach out and you place that hand on a name. Maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe a sibling. And you close your eyes and you hold your hand there for a few moments before retracting it. And only after this ritual does davening begin. There's also something called a makom kavua. A makom kavua in a sanctuary means a regular seat. The rabbis of the Talmud, they understood the habitual nature of sitting in the same place week in and week out in shul. And some of you have established your makom kavua your regular seat, right adjacent to the Yortzite plaques of your loved ones. Many of you know, and I made a point of acknowledging him earlier, many of you know Alan Bresselier. He's somewhere in here. He attends Minion here every single day. He and his family have 26 Yortzite plaques right over there. It goes back all the way to his great-grandparents. Every single morning, whether Alan Bresselier is commemorating a yort site or not, he gets up from his seat when Mourner's Cottage is recited, stands next to those plaques. And every time he hears in this sanctuary, Yit Gadal, V'yit Gadash, Meirabah, the names of his parents, his uncles, his aunts, his grandparents, his great-grandparents stare back at him. For us, the metal that surrounds us on the walls is far from arbitrary. It's a phrase. Know before whom you stand, a phrase that is inscribed on many synagogue walls, above many arcs, and the intent is obvious. It's to convey the seriousness of prayer that we stand before God. But those of you who cherish the plaques to my right and to my left, you expand the meaning. I stand in this space not only before God, but before my parents and my grandparents and before those for whom my gratitude is immeasurable. Well, what if I told you we were going to get rid of them all? Not today. Not next year. In 50 years, when most of us, and perhaps, God forbid, the synagogue itself, will be gone, or will have moved, we're going to get rid of them. Hold that thought. Jews began trickling into Pembroke Pines, Davy, and Cooper City in the 1970s. They were fleeing either congestion or climbing housing costs in North Miami, and to foster some sense of community, these Jews, many of them newly married, many recent parents, they meet at people's homes for Shabbat or holiday dinners, and as their numbers slowly grew, they scraped up enough funds to rent space so their children could have a taste of Jewish community, attend a Hebrew school. But a taste wasn't sufficient, and they knew it. So as their numbers grew still, maybe 75 families, the time had arrived to do what wandering Jews 
migrating Jews have done for 2,000 years, formally establish themselves as a Jewish community by building a synagogue. And at that same time, Butler Ranch, it was a high-end horse stable in Davie. It was home to some of the great horses of the early 70s, including Secretariat, and it hit the market. And for $225,000, 10 families co-signed to buy a few acres of land that included 64 horse stables in a barn. It was fit for a million dollar horse like Secretariat, but that ranch was not fit for our Torah. And so these young Jews, they had no need for the stables, no need for the hot walkers, which is an electric machine to walk horses in a circle, no need for the equine equipment. They sold it all, and with every sale came a little bit more construction. And every Sunday for three years, volunteer laborers, Jews, converted half the barn into six 24 foot by 24 foot classrooms and the other half of the barn into a multi-purpose room. Everyone, including the rabbi and cantor, got their hands dirty on Sundays. They had enough money for an AC unit to make Shabbat services tolerable. Not enough money for a ceiling. So they shared Shabbat and the holidays with pigeons. And the group would grow and continue to grow, eventually moving to an even bigger building. And they would name themselves Temple on the Pines. 20 minutes away, a decade later, another group of Jewish families, they found themselves yearning for Yiddish kite. They moved to a developing area. It wasn't even yet a town. They found comfort, familiarity in a way that only Jews understand. They bumped into each other at Publix or at a restaurant. We need a place to be Jews, they'd say. And six families decided to get together at Country Isles Clubhouse to do just that. And there, they plan an open meeting at Country Isles Elementary School to further explore the yearning for Yiddishkeit. And they used only word of mouth to circulate the information. Email hadn't even been invented yet. How many would come, they wondered. And they were shocked when 50 families, almost all of them young with little kids, they showed up and they decided, we're going to rent a space for the high holidays. And soon thereafter, Country Isles Clubhouse became a gathering space for Friday night services and the group became large enough to need a name. Half wanted B'nai something. Half wanted something of Eve. <laughs> the King Solomon of the group said, let's split it, we'll call it a day. B'nai of Eve was born. And they outgrew Country Isles. And they moved to a storefront, but they quickly realized the time had arrived to do what wandering, migrating Jews have done for 2,000 years. Formally establish themselves as a Jewish community by building a synagogue. And so, when the Arvida group incorporated Weston, they put aside land for churches, for synagogues. 19 families stepped forward, and they bought the plot of land we're standing on today. And they bought it for about as much money as Butler Ranch cost. And like that group, 20 minutes away and a decade earlier, there was only enough money to build a little. So they built classrooms, they built a school, and a multi-purpose room for everything else. Now Temple on the Pines would rapidly expand. They would merge with Beth Am of Hollywood, which was founded in 1956. They would merge with Temple Israel of Miramar, which was founded in 1962. The name would be diplomatically changed to Temple Beth Am Israel, which merged and integrated its membership into B'nai Aviv in 2015. Make sure we all understand. We are here today as a conglomerate of four synagogue histories dating back to 1956. And we have the Yortzite plaques to prove it. I'm not speaking about the ones you see on the walls. I'm speaking about the plaques we inherited from Beth Am Israel, which included those they inherited from Temple Beth Am of Hollywood and Temple Beth Israel of Miramar, a few thousand of them. Now, for those that may recall, after the merger in 2015, there was a significant and prolonged campaign to identify the family members from whom those plaques belonged. Letters written, emails sent, social media posts blitzed, blitzed out to the community at large, and the Yortzite plaques, 
They were laid out on tables in our multi-purpose room for weeks to be claimed. Only a trickle filed in to collect them. 1,500 of them remained. We even bought a digital yurt site board. It's currently displayed in the hallway. And we uploaded all the data. And with all of it preserved, the suggestion was made. Let's hire a company. We'll melt down the remainder of the plaques and get rid of them. And I couldn't do it. As the Mara de Atra of the Shul, the authority on issues pertaining to Jewish law, I had no persuasive argument based in halakha or ritual. No substantive reason to convince them otherwise. My only case was that each of those plaques belonged to an older version of an Alan Bressel leader. An older version of a Rich Cohen. An older version of a Linda Verblo. An older version of someone just like you or I. An older version of a building block of the Jewish community that would eventually become us, B'nai Aviv. And so with no physical place to hang them, because we're not hanging them in the multi-purpose room or the ballroom or the preschool, no place to put them. With no place to put them, we decided that we were going to get a storage facility. And that's where they've been. And the question for what to do with them has re-emerged because the cost of that storage facility has increased significantly enough that we have to ask what to do with these plaques. The names commemorated on the 1,500 plaques in storage do not have a living relative that's part of this community any longer. No halakhic, ritual, or traditional ground to stand upon. And I can tell you my response is even more emphatic eight years later. Look to my left and to my right. Each plaque represents a life, a story, a legacy. They bear the names of our mothers and our fathers, our sons and daughters, our grandparents, our friends. They're not objects to us. They are physical embodiments of our memories, of those who had a measurable impact on our lives, of those who were part of the fabric of our community. But what do we do when there's no surviving relative left to remember them? Now, maybe their descendants moved away. Maybe there are no descendants. Maybe they weren't fortunate enough to have children or grandchildren, or, more likely, perhaps their descendants are just no longer Jews. Whatever the reason, someone who once called a derivative of this community home, someone who painstakingly laid the foundation with their bare hands, for what we now call B'nai Aviv, they put a Yortzite plaque on the wall. A mother, a father, a spouse, and a generation ago, a version of Rich Cohen, a version of Alan Bresselier, a version of Linda Verblow, a version of each and every one of us, kiss those plaques that now sit unclaimed in storage. What are we supposed to do? It's a Jewish story. It's a Jewish question. This is Yisker. We are commanded to remember on this day. What is it exactly we're commanded to remember? What's our obligation? We are caretakers of the Jewish past. Now, earlier this week, I went to the storage unit. I was pressed for time. Angie and I went. Went inside. There's dozens of drawers of Yorkshire plaques. I opened one, and I just randomly grabbed a few of them out. I took them home. Not one had an online footprint. Ancestry.com offered more than, little more than a, a date and place of birth. I made a few phone calls. These are them. Evelyn Gleicher, Sarah Rivka, but Nahum Shlomo. She died in 1975. What I found out was that she and her husband were founding members of Temple Israel in Miramar in 1962. Her plaque sits alone, unclaimed, in a drawer. Random. I randomly chose Evelyn Prafin. 
Evelyn Prafin and her husband were also founding members of Temple Beth Am in Hollywood in 1962. They remained alive and active in the community through its transition until their deaths. Evelyn's husband, Norman, Norman Prafin, was the gabi of the community for 30 years. He literally was Alan Bresselier. Chose it randomly to point out that none of us, none of us is immune to that fate. Whether we come to synagogue once a year on this day, whether we daven here every morning and serve in the highest of ritual roles, each of us risks becoming a name on a plaque with no one present to recognize it, acknowledge it, have gratitude for it, say Kaddish on its behalf. And the plaques, they're still here. We own them. My friends, Yisker is the moment when the past calls out to us. Our loved ones still with us. Their stories, their souls are gathered with us now, urging us to take the next breath, take the next step. And though the word Yisker translates as to remember, it is a journey forward. It is through sadness, through reflection. It's a journey whose end point is in death. It's life. The lives of not just the living, you and I here today, but the lives of those who came before us. And we mourn as individuals. We recall the loved ones whose lives remain wrapped in our presence, who still motivate, inspire, console, advise us, though they're not physically here with us. But we're not just here as individuals remembering our parents, our grandparents, our children, our spouses, our friends. We're here as a community. We're here as an extended family with perhaps an even more sacred obligation. At Yisco, we remind ourselves of the obligation to be the custodians of the past, which for us should include safeguarding the names, contributions, memories of those who played a role in establishing the sacred space, but for whom there may no longer be a descendant present or alive to recite Kaddish in their honor. Now, I've been accused of many things in my life. And as the beginning of the remarks this morning testify, being overly sentimental is one of them. And maybe that's the case. Maybe I'm just overly sentimental. Because the plaques, they meet all the criteria for discarding, according to the book. They sit cluttered in a storage facility. We don't have physical space for them. The quantity's extreme. And in terms of actual value, they're near worthless pieces of metal. But in 50 years, some other rabbi in some other synagogue is going to be confronted with the same dilemma, except this time it will not be these names. It'll be the very names we lovingly kiss before services that will be in question, or perhaps it will be our plaques, our names that they're considering melting down and discarding. And so maybe part of what today entails, I think what part of being a Jew requires is the projection of value, meaning, significance onto that which others would see as inconsequential. That's the spiritual quest that God bestows upon every Jew. It's why we say a bracha, to uncover holiness in the mundane, to extract meaning from the ordinary, to take a piece of metal with a name on it and know that it's not just a piece of metal. Yisker is not a moment of passivity when we're called upon to simply reflect on loved ones. It is a call to action. And I learned this at a very young age. And I'll finish with this story. A boy finds himself face to face with his rabbi a week before Rosh Hashanah. He'd been, once again, sent to the rabbi's study for laughing in Hebrew school class this time, laughing at the sentence, Kotveinu b'sefer achayim, write us in the book of life. He mockingly joked, I guess Jews have their own version of Santa Claus in the sky, checking off who's been naughty and who's been nice. The book of life is pretty ridiculous, he argued. And the rabbi, his hand stroking the hair of his beard at the chin, he stared across his desk at the boy, grappling with how to respond. This was not the boy's first time, nor his last time, that he was condemned to talk with the rabbi. 
Being a Jew isn't just about you, the rabbi began. And the book of life certainly isn't just about you. If it was just a heavenly ledger of signatures monitored by a Jewish Santa Claus, you'd be in pretty serious trouble, young man. And so the harsh intro knocked the boy back into his seat enough for him to listen a little longer. The book of life, the rabbi continued, is a catalog of actions, mitzvot, to be more specific. And seeing the confused look on the boy's face, the rabbi took down an old book from his shelf. He dusted it off, showed the boy what he meant, and he opened it to a page the boy couldn't yet read, a page of Hebrew. Listen to what the Torah says, says the rabbi. You shall keep my statutes and my commandments, which if a person does them, a person shall live in them. You see, he said, and he points to a commentary on the side of the page. He says, the Hasidic thinkers, they believe, write us in the book of life, meant write down our mitzvot. Write down our deeds, sheyesh bem chayot, because within them is life. Within them are countless names of people you may have never met, but who contributed to your ability to be a Jew. When you raise a kiddush cup, when you light Shabbat candles, when you hear Torah being read in shul on Shabbat, or dance with the Torah on Simchat Torah, when you gather around the Seder table, when you, young man, stand under a chuppah, that's the book of life. With every mitzvah you perform, you sanctify the memories of Jews who may no longer be here, but whom you keep alive. Alive in the present by virtue of your actions. So our Yorzeit plaques, our Yorzeit plaques in this room are sacred to us. But perhaps we should be even more protective of those in storage, precisely because they've been forgotten, forgotten by their own families and bequeathed to us, the Jewish community they endeavored to create. Now I pray we will one day be able to find a fitting space, build a fitting space. There's lots of ideas currently being circulated, but in the meantime, our commitment to the 1,500 names in storage is to not only preserve their names, but in their honor to thrive. Thrive as a synagogue. Thrive as a vibrant Jewish community. Write us in the book of life. May the memories of our loved ones live on within the mitzvot we perform. And may the memories of the forgotten Jews who lay the foundation for B'nai Aviv as we know it be motivation for us to solemnly pledge and I paraphrase our past president, Rich Cohen, to solemnly pledge, may this year, 5784, be the best year B'nai Aviv has ever had, and may it be in their honor and in their memory. Amen.